So you want to figure out how to earn full points on a DBQ? Well, point your ear holes this way because I'm about to explain it up real simple in three steps. And everything I'm about to say applies to A Push, AP World, and AP Euro since they're all scored on the exact same rubric. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, now step one to earning full point starts before you even start writing. And that means you need to know how to understand exactly what they're asking you about in the prompt. And this is real important because in case you haven't encountered a DBQ prompt written by the fair folks at the college board, they can often make you feel about as confused as a fart in a fan factory. So let me show you three keys to understanding and unlocking that mired mess of a prompt. The first thing you need to do is make a note of what time period they're asking you to write about. If they ask you about immigration in the second half of the 19th century and you write about immigration in the first half of the 19th century, you burnt. And if the prompt gives you centuries, write out the actual year numbers. For example, if they want you to write about the 16th century, write out 1500s. Now, I know that sounds elementary, but when you're under pressure, you are dumb than you think. It's just a law of the universe, so make sure you get the dates correct. And by the way, if you're doing this digitally as you will for the national exam, they will have annotation tools for you, so make sure you use them to this end. And the second thing you need to do is mark the category or categories in which they want you to write. For example, the 2024 APUSH DBQ was this. Evaluate the extent to which the institution of slavery shaped United States society between 1783 and 1840. Now in that prompt, you need to mark or underline or make a note of that word, society. That that is the key word. Your essay is going to need to deal with how slavery affected society in that date range. And I'm not sure that I can overstate how important it is to keep that category in the front and center. Because in this case, you're going to see slavery and you're probably going to get a little excited because you remember the Missouri Compromise or the Three-Fifths Compromise and all the rest. But those are mostly political causes and effects of slavery, not social effects. And that essay, even if it's the most brilliant piece of historical writing in the history of historical writing, won't get you any points. Now, to be clear, those two political things had social ramifications, and that's fine if you write about that, but just make sure you're focusing on the social piece of it. And then the third thing you need to do is either notice or decide which historical thinking skill is going to frame your essay. Now, I say notice or decide because sometimes they're just going to tell you what the skill is, and then sometimes they won't, and you have to decide which thinking skill is most appropriate for your essay. For example, in the AP Euro prompt from 2022, the historical thinking skill is explicitly stated. Which of these reasons caused the English Civil War? So your essay needs to demonstrate causation. But in this prompt right here from the 2022 APUSH exam, the historical thinking skill is not explicitly stated. So that means you could write a causation essay here, or you could write a continuity and change over time, or whatever writer's choice. Okay, now before we get to step two, let me mention two resources that might help you in writing your DBQ. First is a DBQ planning sheet, which is free and linked below. The second is my APSA cram course, which has videos from this guy that you're not going to find here on YouTube. In this course, I explain in detail every skill and every rubric point for the DBQ and the LEQ and the SAQ. So if that sounds like something that may help you, then get your clicky finger out and do your work. Okay, so now you understand the prompts because you're a proper genius. And then the second step is to read and understand the documents that they give you. And I reckon this is where many of you start to get a little sweaty. But don't worry, I'm going to show you how to handle these documents and offer a couple of tips that you may not have known before. So crack them brain folds open and remember what I'm about to say. Now you're going to have seven documents after your prompt. No more, no less. And the suggested reading period for the documents is 15 minutes. And I think that's about right for what you need to do with them. And let me tell you what that is. First, read the documents one at a time quickly. And by quickly, I mean maybe a minute or two each. And I can already hear the great weeping and gnashing of teeth rising up at this point. Some of the documents are hard to understand and I need to spend more time on them. Now listen, you do you, boo, but over the course of the school year, you need to get enough practice with interpreting documents that you can read and understand them relatively quickly. Now pay attention here because what I'm about to say is probably not intuitive to most students and yet it can make the difference between a high scoring essay and a low scoring essay that wrecks your future prospects and ensures that you will in fact live in a van down by the river. Okay, here it is. When you start reading the document, don't start by reading the document. What you talking about, Willis? You actually need to start reading here at this citation. And I know that profoundly distracted monkey in your brain is going to want to skip over that because he judges it to be unimportant. Like this is an academic document and they just have to cite their sources because of dumb things like academic integrity or whatever. And your brain monkey is going to try to convince you that this is a throwaway line that makes no difference to your essay, but that monkey is a chump. This is arguably one of the most important lines in the whole document. It's going to tell you who wrote it or who produced it. It's going to tell you the year that it was written or produced, and it might offer some critical information that you might not otherwise know. And here's why that's so important. Here's a document from the 2024 AP World DBQ about how communism affected Soviet and or Chinese society. So if you started reading here, it would take you a minute or two if you're at the top of your game to understand that it represents a negative view of communism and its attendant repressions in the Soviet Union. But if you're not at the top of your 
Warfare game, you might have to read it a couple times to understand that point. But here's the magic. If you start here at the citation, you'll already know that this document is critical of Stalin's communist policies because it was written during the period of reform known as de-Stalinization. Like when you're under pressure and time is short, it's huge to have this much help before you even start reading. Okay, second, summarize the main idea of the document in your own words off to the side. Like don't quote it, summarize it. And this is gonna feel hard and that's because it is hard. Your synapses are gonna be firing like crazy, but summarizing these documents is gonna help you in writing about them. So just write down the main idea and move on. And again, if you're doing this on the digital exam, make use of those annotation tools that they give you. And then third, group your documents. Now, this isn't required on the rubric, but it's often the difference between a high scoring and a low scoring essay. So as you're reading through the documents and summarizing them, write next to it what kind of document it is. If it's a document about economics, write economics. If religion, then write religion. If social, write social, or positive impact or negative impact, and so on. These are gonna be your grouping categories, and the rule of thumb is to have two to three categories, since that's about all you can do with seven documents. But that's not a hard rule, it's just a suggestion. Anyway, once you have your categories set up and your documents organized under them, you now have the beginnings of a thesis and the structure of your essay. Now, the one thing you don't want to do with your documents is write an essay that basically goes like this. In document one, it says, in document two, it says, in document three, it says, etc. It is almost impossible to get a high score that way, and it's usually a signal to the reader that the person who wrote this essay doesn't know how to handle evidence. So grouping your documents will save you from that error. And finally, step three is to actually write your essay. So let me go through the rubric point by point so you know exactly what you need to do in order to earn all seven points. And I'll just talk in generalities here, and if you want more specifics, I got a lot more videos that you can reference. So the first point on the rubric is for the thesis, and you can earn up to one point here. Now, arguably, the thesis is one of the most important things you're gonna write in this essay because it frames your entire argument. Your thesis should be your entire argument in miniature. So the rubric says that you earn this point by writing a historically defensible thesis that establishes a line of reasoning. So what in the fresh heck does that mean? Well, let's take it one at a time. First, it must be historically defensible. That means you have to take a position here. Was the English Civil War primarily caused by religion or politics? Which one was it? Did imperialism affect economies to a great extent or not much at all? Which is it? Did the United States develop a national identity between 1800 and 1855 or not really? So your thesis needs to take a clear position. And also this means that your thesis needs to be factually correct. Like if your thesis says that the Emancipation Proclamation caused European imperial expansion, then no, that's like not true in any universe discovered or undiscovered. Actually, I suppose it could be true in a universe in which time runs backwards, but unless you get someone from that universe to evaluate that argument, then, you know. It's not gonna work. Second, the thesis has to establish a line of reasoning. That means you need to demonstrate how you're going to prove the argument that you're making, and you do that by dropping vocabulary into your thesis, and here's what I mean. The United States developed a national identity to a great extent from 1800 to 1855. Now, that is historically defensible. It takes a position, but it does not establish a line of reasoning. This thesis would not earn the point. But watch what happens when we take that argument and establish a line of reasoning. Despite the exclusion of minorities from the American national identity, the majority majority in the United States did develop a national identity to a great extent as a result of the nationalizing forces after the War of 1812 and the expansion of democracy during the Age of Jackson. Now notice I've done three things here. First, I acknowledge a counter-argument. There are documents about Cherokee Indians and women and black Americans that demonstrate their marginalization. Second, I use the language of the prompt to frame my argument. That's important because it ensures that you're writing about what you're supposed to be writing about. And third, I established a line of reasoning by using specific historical evidence. I wasn't vague, I named these pieces of evidence. And though I'm not even sure that's the argument I would make on that essay, the thesis would earn the point. So just make sure that you're packing that thesis tighter than a Scottish haggis and you'll be golden. And if you want a formula for the thesis, I'll give you one. Restate the important parts of the prompt because A and B. So use the language of the prompt to frame your argument and then A and B will be your specific historical evidence. It's basic, but it checks all the boxes for the thesis point. Okay, the second point is for contextualization and you can earn up to one point here. A contextualization is there to situate your argument in the larger historical context. Now the rubric tells you that you can explain the historical context before, during, or after the time period of your prompt. But by far the most intuitive way to earn this point is by explaining the relevant events that occurred before your given time period. And so in order to earn this point, your contextualization should be about two to four content-rich sentences that describe historical events related to your prompt. And that's important. Your contextualization needs to be related and relevant to the topic of the prompt. So for example, you've got your thesis arguing about the effects of European expansion in African and Asian economies in the 19th and 20th. 
20th century. So your contextualization needs to go backwards in time and explain how we got there. So it needs to explore either the second wave of European imperialism and how that came about, or African and Asian economies before the time period, or ideally both. Now you can't just talk about events that happened before the time period. You have to talk about related events that occurred before the time period. And you have to be specific. Again, drop vocabulary words into this. Talk about the Spanish colonial empire and the Americas and the cash crop systems, whatever, be specific. Okay, now another question, how far should you go back in your contextualization? Well, you're looking at the immediate context. And the general rule of thumb here is about 50 to 100 years and closer to 50 than 100. And that's just a general guideline. It really depends on the prompt. Okay, now we get to the evidence section. And as I mentioned, you'll have seven documents to work with. And I'm gonna give you the point breakdown first and then show you how to earn them. So in this section, you can earn up to three points. One point is awarded for successfully describing the contents of three documents in relation to the prompt. And then two points are awarded for supporting your argument with at least four documents. Okay, so that's the two points in the evidence section. You can earn the remaining one point by writing about evidence related to your prompt, but which is not mentioned in the documents. And this is called evidence beyond the documents. And if you do that successfully, that's one point. So two points for the documents and one point for evidence beyond the documents for a total of three points. Okay, now that was a lot. Let me just explain a little and let's start with your handling of the documents. Now, I hope you noticed that there are two different ways of handling the documents. You can describe them or you can support an argument with them. Describing gets you one point and supporting gets you two. So what's the difference? Well, describing a document is exactly what it sounds like. You say something like document one says, and then you accurately summarize the document, not a quote, but a summary. And if you do that three times, one point. But you're not here for one point. You're here for full points, baby. So let's see how to use at least four documents to support an argument. The first step is to describe the contents of the document. Document one says, and then accurately summarize the document in your own words. And I know there are teachers out there rolling their eyes at me like documents don't say, people say, don't start your sentence with document one says. Look, I know and I agree with you, but for simplicity and clarity, I'm gonna explain it like this. So, you know, do whatever you wanna do. So you summarize the document and then you begin the next sentence with this shows or this demonstrates and then write about how that document proves your thesis. You've always gotta be tying your evidence back to your thesis. And this is the best way that I know how to do it. So to me, the key to getting this point comes down to two things. First is the grouping of the documents, which I already talked about back in step one. Second is topic sentences. So for example, suppose I group documents one, three, and five as economic documents. So in order to use these in support of an argument, I'd start by writing a topic sentence for the paragraph that explained why economics was the cause of such and such. And then within the paragraph, I'd use my documents as evidence to demonstrate why that is true. Okay, the next part of the evidence section is the one point for evidence beyond the documents. Now to earn this point, you need to connect a specific piece of evidence not mentioned in the documents to the argument of your essay. And this requires you to name it, explain what it is, and then connect it to your argument. So three things, name, explain, and connect. And people tend to lose this point because they can usually name a piece of evidence, but then they forget to explain it or connect it. And there's no specific place that you need to do this. Just stick it wherever it's relevant to your argument. And one more important thing to mention here is that your evidence beyond the documents needs to come from the same time period that is given in the prompt. And then the last section of the rubric is for analysis analysis and reasoning, and for this section you can earn up to two points. The first section is about sourcing documents, and you can earn one point there for sourcing at least two documents. Now this is one of the harder things for most students to do, so let me try to explain. To source a document means that you show how that document's historical situation, audience, purpose, or point of view is relevant to the interpretation of the document. The acronym here is HAPPY, and I'll tell you about the why in a moment. So to source for historical situation means to place that document in its larger historical context. So if your document is Lincoln's second inaugural address, then it might be important important to know its historical situation, which is to say the American Civil War. And then to source for audience, you need to demonstrate why it's important for us to know to whom this was written. So a personal letter might say something much different about a person than a political stump speech, and the difference comes down to audience. And then to source for purpose, you need to explain what a document was intended to do. Not what it says, but what it did. So if you have a nationalistic speech from a leader of a colonized nation, then you need to tell us what that speech actually was intended to accomplish. Like, did the speaker want the people to rise up and demand independence? because of this, etc. So to source for point of view, you need to answer the question, why does he or she say what he or she says in the way that he or she says it? And the special sauce of point of view analysis comes from the end of that question, in the way that he or she says it. Now you only have to perform one of these sourcing skills for each document you try to source. So for example, if you're gonna source
source document too, you don't have to go through all four of those sourcing skills. Just choose the one that makes most sense for that document. So your sourcing sentence should say something like the historical situation of this document is X, and that matters because, and that second sentence is the why of happy. Why does your sourcing analysis matter to the interpretation of the document and your overall argument? And if you don't do that for your sourcing, you're unlikely to earn the point. So do that for two documents, and actually I'd recommend three in case you get one wrong, and then you're gonna get that point. And then the final part of this section of the rubric is awarded for complexity, and you can earn one point for this skill. And the rubric gives you like seven different ways to earn this point, but I'm only gonna explain the two most straightforward methods. First, you can earn complexity by successfully using all seven documents to support your thesis. And it doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be elegant. If you do for all seven documents the same thing you did for those four documents in the evidence section, then boom, complexity point. Second, you can earn complexity by successfully sourcing four documents instead of two. Again, the skill is the same, you just have to do it two more times, and if you do that, boom, complexity point. And then the very last thing you need to remember about the complexity point is that it can be awarded for part of the essay. So if you choose any of these other ways to earn complexity, which in my opinion are harder than the two explained, then you can demonstrate that skill in a well-crafted paragraph. Which is to say, the whole essay doesn't necessarily need to be complex. Okay, click here to see my other videos on the various skills needed for the DBQ, and you can click right here to grab my AP essay cram course and I'll hold your hand through all the writing. So good luck on those DBQs and I'll catch on the flip-flop. I'm Larout.